Well, I'm uh, glad you guys are here this morning. We are starting a brand new series today called um, Made for More. And so I want you to know that, uh, that you were made for more, that, that God has something bigger for you. Before I get into the message this morning, I just want to tell you about a couple of things that's going on. We actually have a, uh, a pretty cool event coming up this Saturday. Uh, you don't want to miss that. We actually got rained out on serve day. I talked about Barry a little too much. I bad mouthed him. I called him a weenie. I said he didn't have a whole lot. And then he dropped a bomb on us because we uh, got rain after more rain. That's my bad. I'll take credit for that. I should not have said anything bad about Barry because he showing up brought the rain. 20-something inches in Ragley, 22, 23 inches in Ragley. So uh, it's God's country down here. Ragley's a little north, so maybe I need to scooch on down here to God's country. We only got about 12 inches, and so, uh, so it's, it's really, uh, it was really a, a, a really tough uh, situation that, that some people found themselves in. We uh, reached out to some of our people. We didn't really have anybody in with, with flooding except for the Winfrey's who live on the river who had four feet of water uh, not really in there. It's not really in your house. It's more like in your garage, I guess. It's their house is built up for a reason. But thank goodness we didn't have a ton of of, uh, of flooding going on in the people that that we knew that, that that we reached out to. So hopefully you survived that pretty well. Uh, but listen, we had to move that serve day because of Barry. Uh, we had a few people go out and serve. But this Saturday at uh, ten o'clock, we're going to start serving our community, and we have. About 300 backpacks to give away, maybe a little more. It's going to be first come, first serve. Uh, they will start lining up at the door about 8.30. Uh, for about an hour and a half, they'll be out here waiting. So about 8 o'clock, we want you guys to get here. We want you to sign up. You can actually go to the app and do that. Uh, you can go to the app and sign up. Go to events and click on back to school batch, uh, back to school batch, and click that and click sign up now. And it'll ask you which area you want to serve in. We're going to have a petting zoo. We're going to have jumpy houses. We're going to have food to cook. Uh, we're going to have a prayer team walking around. We're going to have, uh, we're gonna have people uh, with the backpacks organizing that. School supplies are putting names on backpacks with the, the little cute little programs that they have. It's real precious. Uh, it's really cool. The kids love it. it is, precious is my new word if you haven't caught on to that. I say precious around my house a lot. Uh, and so it may, maybe that's your, uh, I keep checking my phone. You guys are supposed to be getting a notification, but I haven't seen it yet, so I keep checking it. If you, in just a little bit, you should, should be getting a notification from our app if you have our app. It went through. So if you have our app, okay, y'all are seeing it now. Okay, good. I didn't get it, so maybe I need to download the app. Maybe that's what I need to do. I, I have the app. Why didn't I get the notification? Apple, I'll tell you. So you got, a, you got a notification, so if you click on that, it'll take you to the sign-up. So if you want to do that now, you can. I'll wait a second. But sign up to serve. I'm telling you, you don't want to miss this. You do not want to miss Serve Day. Uh, this is our new Serve Day project, and there are going to be, last year, I think 400-plus people came that we, that we could kind of count as best we could. And so God's going to bless this time, so don't miss that. Be here at 8 o'clock. We're going to have a little time of instruction, have a little bit of worship, and then get ready to serve our community. So don't miss that. That's this Saturday. You have plenty of opportunity to serve. Don't miss out on that. All right, so this morning I want to, I want to talk to you about the value of placement. Uh, you, you're, you were made for more, but what I have found in life is sometimes we aren't we, we, we feel like we have a calling, but we don't really know our place. And, 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 and what I've found is, and you'll, we'll find this in Scripture, we'll look at this in Scripture, is when you find your right place, the value it explodes exponentially. I mean, you can have some, some D-cell batteries right now with a flashlight with no batteries in it and two D-cell batteries. They won't do you any good. You put the batteries in the flashlight, now you got something. So the value is in the placement. The value is not just in, 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 in the structure itself. The value is not just in who you are. The value is when you place yourself in the right place. And we have seen that here at WRC over and over and over again. Placement is so, so, so important. And we were at a conference. Um, I think it was probably one of the last ones I went to. And, and I realized something as I was um, looking down the aisles. You know, people, people will, uh, if they want to save their place, if they want to save their position, um, they do something kind of weird. I started thinking about I started looking down the aisles and started seeing some stuff in the seats. And so I started thinking about it. I started looking at some of the things that were in the seats. And it really was some crazy stuff. And so I thought, man, let me just see what, 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 what they're putting there. And I got to thinking about it. And they're really, some of them was just pieces of paper. And so I, I just grabbed a couple pieces of paper off my desk. I pulled this out of my trash can, actually. Uh, anybody want to buy this for $10? I'll sell it for $10. Anybody got any takers for $10? Come on, go on, watch, go on, come on, come on, come on, $10, $10. This is some notes I made this morning to make a couple little changes to my message. They really don't have a lot of value. Nobody here wants to spend $10 on this. See, see, this was placed in the trash can. That means it's trash. Like, my wife does not dig through the trash can before she throws the trash out. At the house, I do it here. She'll go around and grab the trash and throw it away for us before it gets too full because me and Jeremy like to balance the trash can. You know what I'm saying? I'm the winner so far. I got up to about six feet. Uh, he's still trying to catch me. But, but she don't get through the trash and go, I wonder if he, this is trash. If it's placed in the trash can, it's probably trash. 
But see, you place this in a chair at a conference, and all of a sudden, it's worth something. All of a sudden, it's valuable because of its placement. See, when I pull this out of the trash can this morning, it's still trash, but you put it right here, it'll save your spot for hours at a conference. Now, not in a concert. You go to a concert, it's, it's a free-for-all, okay? You'll get knocked out trying to save a seat like that. But you go to a conference where there's some, you know, some Christian people show up, I'll pass right by that seat every time. Piece of trash sitting in there. Oh, somebody's saving the seat. We, uh, I think it was Megan's graduation. We were at uh, Burton Coliseum, and they have a strict rule, no seat saving. No seat saving. You can't supposed to save seats. Well, there was a whole, we, want, we couldn't even sit with our family because there was, like, people around us saving, like, rows and rows of seats. You know, I was a little bit fired up about it, so I just sat there and fumed and fumed. I mean, our, our family's sitting all over the place. And we got this big old empty row behind me. He kept saying, no, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. Those rows never filled up. I want to follow that dude outside, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> no seat saving. See, he just had stuff placed in the seats, and it saved the seat. See, placement is where the value comes in. You can have batteries all day long and flashlights that don't work. You've got to put the batteries in the flashlight. Placement is what matters. You have to be in the right place. And so God has called you to more, but until you put yourself in the right place, the devil's calling you trash. I'm telling you right, God wants you to put you in a seat. God wants you to be seated. He wa- he's got something for you. The devil's calling you trash. And listen, it's, you're only trash if you believe you're trash. And even then you're not because Jesus down on the cross, he said you're not trash. But the value's in the placement. Uh, it's in the placement. And so it, the placement is so important. The position is so important. I want to show a few places in Scripture this morning where this is the case. Uh, the Jesus is teaching this morning. Or in this, not this, well, Jesus is kind of teaching this morning. He's re, I'm reteaching what he taught. Um, I heard somebody say this, thought this was interesting. You know, if Jesus came back today, he'd be a movie producer. Think about it. He told parables. That's what he did. He, he told stories. And so he'd be a movie producer today if he came back today. But here's him telling a story. He's creating this movie-type atmosphere with the, with the guys around him. And he wanted to teach them a lesson. And here's what he said. He told them about many things and many parables. He said, there's a farmer that went out to sow his seed. And as he would scatter the seeds, he, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Now, here's what I want you to see this morning. The seed still has power. The seed still has life. The seed can still make a difference. The problem is not with the seed. Uh, we know that the seed is our words. The seed is the word of God. The words that we speak are our seeds. And so it's not in the seed. The power is in the seed. It's where it lands. That's the problem. It's the placement. So some went on the path, and he said the birds came in up, and then some fell along rocky places where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly, but, then the, soil, but the soil was shallow. So again, we see the same seed, same life. Same, it can, be, it can be, become fruitful. Uh, listen, every tree in your yard at once was a seed. And so it's where it was placed. If you place it on concrete, it would never become the tree that it is. And so he said there's some rocky places. The, pla- the problem is the placement. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Here's another one. Some fell among the thorns. Are you getting what I'm saying here? It's, it's about placement. I could have put seeds all along this, this stage two weeks ago. In fact, we could have done it when we started the church six years ago, and they would still be sitting here because placement is what matters. See, the value is in the placement. The value is in where you put yourself. God has given you incredible talents, but you have to find your fit. And so I, hopefully I'll help you do that this morning. I'm going to give you three things in just a minute to help you, to help you understand the value of placement. But listen, these, all these seeds were the same. As far as we know, these were the same seed. None of them produced, and then still other found, found good soul. So the difference is in the placement. So that's where the value is at. Your value is in your placement. And uh, I was reading this, this whole message came out of 1 Kings. I was reading through 1 Kings, the story of Elijah and Elisha. Elijah was an incredible prophet, had incredible miracles. In fact, uh, a few chapters before, one chapter before we actually what we're reading today, he actually called down fire from heaven, burned up just, just water and, and, and a sacrifice, killed hundreds of prophets of Baal. I mean, it was an incredible feat. So, so here's a guy who just, I mean, he's got to be known around the land for what God's done through his life, but... Again, the, then Jezebel shows up, and Jezebel chases him off, and it's an incredible story. I don't have time to get into that this morning, but that's Elijah. Elijah was incredible. He had some awesome, awesome testimonies of what God had done through him because he placed himself in a place where God could use him. So Elijah is getting discouraged. Now he's called down fire from heaven. Uh, now he's got these, uh, these, uh, this Jezebel and Ahab after him. Ahab was a crybaby. I'm like, gosh, this dude here, just, it's, just, it's comical. Uh, so he couldn't get somebody's vineyard one time, so he went home and told Jezebel. And Jezebel went out and killed the dude and said, okay, you can have the vineyard now. She's something else. 
So anyway, he's, so now Jezebel's after uh, Elijah, and Elijah's on the run. And now he's frustrated. He's like, God, kill me now. I'm done with this. I don't want to do this no more. Yes, you just killed hundreds of prophets of Baal, and now this chick's after me, and I'm in trouble. He didn't, that's, not, that's like Andy Thomas' version. That's not King James. He was running for his life. And he was very discouraged, and God, and, and God spoke to him and said, no, there are hundreds and hundreds that have not bowed their knee. You're not alone. Let me just tell you this morning, you're not alone no matter where you're at. You're not alone. You feel like you've been placed uh, in a position by yourself or you've been on an island somewhere. You're not alone. And God had talked to Elijah. He said, listen, you're not alone. So here, here's what God uh, tells him. Uh, he tells him, I want you to go find Elisha. I, I, got, I got a guy that's going to help you out. He's going he's to come to your, come to your aid. You're going to really need this guy. He's going to be your servant. So Elijah goes and finds Elisha. So the Bible says Elisha went from there, and he found Elisha, son of Snapchat. <laughs> you, you just thought that was new, right? And that's, no, it's Shaphat. He was plowing. It looks like Snapchat, don't it? He was plowing with a 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Now, let me just stop right here and just say uh, this is a weird thing to do. Now, back in the day, it meant something. But I'm out there plowing. I'm sweating. I'm about to die. He's stroke. You're going, what, you trying to kill me? You're going to put a jacket on top of me? Can you imagine me and mowing your grass at 4 in the afternoon in July and somebody couldn't put a coat on you? Stay out of my yard, man. So then, then Elisha, he, then he leaves his oxen and runs after Elijah because he put his cloak around him. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied, what have I done to you? Because he understood the, the, the weight that he was putting on him. So Elijah left and went back. He took his yoke of oxen, slaughtered them, burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat, and gave it to the people, and they ate it. And then he was set out to follow Elijah. So, so I'm going I'm to dig into these scriptures. I know I flew through them. I'm going to go back and dig in a little bit. I'm going to give you three things to help you understand the value of placement. Three things that will help you understand that when you're placed in the right place, it's going to help you understand your value. Let me just give you number one that I see right here in these three verses. Number one is don't get tethered to a title. Don't get so hung up in a title. See, Elijah, uh, Elisha uh, was a farmer. Actually, Elijah just looked like a farmer. His parents were farmers, maybe his grandparents were farmers, maybe his great-grandparents were farmers. So he's out uh, plowing the field with oxen, 12 oak yoke of oxen. He's driving the last pair. He looked a whole lot like a farmer. And I want you to see this this morning, that, that, that he was not hung up in the title that somebody had placed on top of him. See, he was, by title, he was a farmer. He was not actually a farmer. Uh, let's see exactly what it looked like. He, it kind of looked like he was, a pl- he was a farmer. He was plowing, right? That's what farmers do, they plow. He was actually plowing the field. He's doing this thing. He's going through life, and maybe you've been there. I've been there. Uh, I, was a, I was a clerk at one point. I worked on AC units at one point as far as my job. Uh, I was a cashier. Uh, I worked in a warehouse. I ran a warehouse. I was a dispatch for a shipping company or a, a valve company. Uh, I, began, I was in sales. I've been in management. Yeah, I, I, see, I was, I was those things, and for a long time, I thought that's who I was. See, for a long time, I thought I was just a warehouse worker. But at the time, I was just honestly just trying to pay the bills because I had had a job where they write me hot checks. It's a whole other story I don't have time to get into. But it's really cool when you go to the, the bank that they wrote the check from and they say, you're 10 minutes late, the other guy beat you here because he had the money in the bank got out whenever he gave me the check. What? See, I was, I was, that broke my spirit. So I moved from that job, and now I'm just a warehouse guy. I don't, as long as the check don't bounce, I'll be here forever. That's how I felt. And then God moved me out of that. To the, but listen, I was tied up in my title. I was tied up in, in, in my title. I was a cashier. That's who I was. I was a warehouse worker. That's who I was. And here Elijah, is, he's, he's probably fighting with this a little bit on the inside. He looks a lot like a farmer. Let me just tell you, don't get tethered to a title. Don't get hung up on your title. Because here's what I know about Elijah. Um, Elisha was not a farmer. He was a prophet with a plow. Hmm. I'm just going to let that one sit just for a second. Elisha was not a farmer. He was a prophet with a plow. It may look like you're one thing today, but God's saying there's a whole lot more. Anybody ever use the word just, or maybe you just use the word just when you describe yourself? I'm just a stay-at-home mom. I'm just a stay-at-home dad. I'm just a secretary. You're not just a secretary. You're a missionary with some stationery. That's what you are. <laughs> see, that, see, we got we to gotta see ourselves different. Elijah looked like, he looked like a farmer. On the outside, he was a farmer. He probably smelled like a farmer. He looked like a farmer. Farmers don't smell very good, by the way. I know. 
I got family members that have been. I mean, they just there. It's that's a hard, hard job to have. You're up at, at sun, before the sun comes up. You're out till the sun goes. I mean, it's a very busy job. He probably looked a lot like a farmer, but he was not a farmer. He was a prophet with a plow. Now, here's what I found. I've done some research, and I found out that um, I started. I started looking at different generational businesses, like. You know, first generation, the second, and then the third, and then the fourth. And I started thinking about how, how, what kind of success rate is there? See, a lot of times when you're, when you're stuck in Elijah's position, and maybe you've been there, your parents have had, a, they've had a, 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 a job for you, or maybe they had a business and you were supposed to take it over, and you just didn't have the passion, you didn't have the heart for it. It looked like that's what you were supposed to do, but it just wasn't, it wasn't who you were. So I started doing the research, and I found out that first-generation uh, 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 companies, only 30% make it to the second generation. Only 12% of those make it to the third generation, and only 3% of those make it to the fourth generation. You know why? Because we're putting titles on people that that ain't, that ain't who they are. I mean, it sounds great. Man, I hope my, you know, my dad created a ministry, and I feel like God's called me to take it over. And, and at some point, that's what I'm going to be doing. Of course, it's going to be within the church. I'm not saying that's what I'm doing full time, but I feel responsible for keeping that going. But it's, it's a passion inside of me. But there are a lot of people who look like a farmer, but they're really a prophet with a plow. And maybe that's where you are today. You, you look a certain, maybe you just look like a stay-at-home mom, but God's got something bigger for you. There's nothing wrong with being saying, hey, listen, you guys, you ladies work more than anybody. Y'all make me tired. But Elisha was not a farmer. He was a prophet with a plow. But I want you to know that he wasn't the only one that went through this. I thought about David. You know, David, it was interesting. The whole story from David from beginning to end. David was the youngest son of Jesse. In fact, let me just tell you how they described him when Elijah, I'm sorry, Samuel showed up to anoint somebody king because it had to be the greatest looking guy, right? The biggest, baddest dude in the house. No, that's not the way it was. Watch this. All the seven sons of Jesse presented himself to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. They look like kings. They smell like kings. They probably taste like kings, but they're not the king. See, see looks can be deceiving. Then Samuel said, are there, is this all the sons that you have? Now, seven of them showed up. Now, if you bring seven boys in front of me and say to your son, I ain't going to say you got more. You got a house full of fighting. That's what you got. There's only three boys in my family. I have two brothers and a sister, and we fought all the time. My parents would leave. We, we lived, we were usually at least an hour plus away from like a Walmart because we lived in the, in the boonies when my dad would pastor small country churches. And so we would, we, that's what we, they would be gone. So they would go get groceries for four or five, six, seven hours they would be gone. And they would come back and kind of like, this don't look quite right. There's something wrong with the living room. Well, yeah, because we had flipped over every piece of furniture and we had checker wars. Ever had a checker war? Like checkers. Like you take, they hurt, son. If you get the right angle, son, you can hurt, you can cut somebody with them jokers. But I mean, there would like be a lamp. She'd go touch the lamp and it would fall apart, that kind of stuff. We were rough house food. Because I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, seven sons, and he goes, he goes, do you have another one? Are you serious? Yeah, I have an eighth one. But here's what he says about him. I want you to see this description. There is still the youngest. In other words, he's out, we ain't going to worry about him. He's out there. When you told me you were coming, I didn't even think about him. That's what he was saying. Just replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. You know who does that? Shepherds, not kings. Shepherds watch sheep and goats. He said, send for him at once. And Samuel said, he said, we won't even sit down until he gets here. We're not even going to sit down. Get him, get him coming. So Jesse sent for him, and he was stark, dark and handsome, just a really nice-looking dude. He had beautiful eyes, and the Lord said, this is the one. See, David even struggled with that, and he continued to struggle with it. I think about him going to fight Goliath. He, uh, his dad's like, hey, buddy, your, your brothers, your seven brothers, the real fighters, they're, they're real grown men. They're out fighting the battle. You're watching sheep. Let me just go ahead and give you some food to bring to them. It was the very first Uber Eats <laughs> ever. So he puts him, puts him in his little whatever, Fiat or whatever, and he goes and he's heading out. And he's going to go bring some cheese and bread. I don't know why they chose the food they did. He shows up. He finds out about Goliath, and he's like, I got to get in on this. What is going on? Why is this dude standing here? Why aren't we fighting this guy? What are y'all doing? And here's what his brother heard what was going on. And, and watch this. The Bible says, but when the David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. And watch what he said. What about those few sheep? you were supposed to be watching, or you're supposed to be taking care of. See, he had a label of a shepherd on him. He was not a warrior. But yet, he was anointed king already. Uh, get, I want you to get this. See, David came in and got anointed king and went right back out and watched the sheep. See, he was a shepherd in the field, but he was really a king has already been anointed. I want you to know today, God has anointed you to something bigger and something better. You may look like an office worker, but you got so much more to offer. 
Listen, don't be tethered to a title. Don't be tethered to a title. Don't be limited by a label. Don't let the things that people call you let be limited to what you're going to do. Yes, you're a parent, but be more than that. You're actually pouring into generations. The things that you teach your kids is going to go on for generation to generation to generation. Don't be tethered to a title. If you want to understand the value of placement, don't be tethered to a title. Here's number two I want to give you this morning. Uh, say yes to the next step. Listen, Elisha had a choice to make. Elisha had a choice. He got the cloak put on him. He's about to have a heat stroke. But that's why he took off running. He had to cool off. He had to get a little wind flow. That's really what was happening. But listen, Elijah showed up to Elisha, put the cloak around him. He should have been, he could have been like, what, dude? I got, you see, I ain't even done with this row yet. I'm on the oxen. I'm busy. This is what I'm doing. Listen, if you're going to understand the value of placement, you've got to say yes to the next step. You've got to start saying yes. Sometimes God will keep asking you and keep asking you and keep asking you. And I think there's probably a day coming where he won't ask you anymore. He'll go find somebody else. Right now, in, in this room right now, there are dozens of you sitting here, and you know that God's calling you to something more, and you keep saying no, and you keep saying no, and you keep saying no. you got to say yes. Here's his response. Elisha then left his oxen and ran. He didn't be like, you know, i got to find a place to keep them. Who's going to take my place? Uh, I don't know if anybody can do it as well as I can. Hello, somebody. You ever been there? Like, I would give that up, but they can't do it as good as I can. You ever seen that dude plow a row? He can't plow a straight row. We, we are controlling about who we think we're supposed to be in God, saying you ain't even supposed to be in the field. You're supposed to be over here anointing other people to be king. That's where I really called you to be. See, God's called us to something more. And we get so hung up on where we're at and who's going to take over and who's going to take care of what. And these are my oxen, and I named them all, and who's going to do. He, he, wasn't struck, he wasn't hung up in all that. He wasn't hung up on that. He just said yes. You know, it's, it's tough to say yes. Man, it's tough to, to, to say yes to when you don't know what the future looks like. It's tough when you don't know when the next paycheck's coming in. I, I, I mean, my dad, I'm just, I've talked about this before, but my dad was a minister for 33 years. He stepped out of that to go full-time evangelism, had zero monthly support. One lady, I take that back, one lady said, I'll give you $100 a month. That's it. He had like six meetings scheduled, and that was it. And he stepped out of something that was very comfortable, insurance. He had a, a check that didn't bounce every, every month. He had everything taken care of where he was at. But God said, I got something bigger for you. And he took that step. And he's been doing it now for uh, 16 years, 15 or 16 years, because he had to take the first step. Man, say yes to your next step. Maybe your next step is serving. you got a great opportunity this Saturday. You don't have to be on a dream team. Just show up here at 8 o'clock. We'll get you a little nice, cool-looking red shirt. You see some floating around here? We'll get you a shirt, get you plugged in, and find you a place to serve. I'm telling you right now, you're never happier than when you're serving somebody else. In fact, I would say that about our people here at WRC. The happiest people at WRC are the ones that are serving, period. So God's calling you to something more. You just got to say yes to your next step. Listen to his response. He said he left his oxen and he ran after him. Say yes. Just say, I know it's hard. I know I'm, I know I'm just, I'm, I'm actually just, just, just um, I'm dismissing your next paycheck. I know I'm dismissing your abilities. I know I'm dismissing your personality. But listen, God is not. God is saying, I have a calling for you. You just have to say yes. And listen, saying no is not cool. All right, let's just, let me just tell you, uh, no answer to God is a no. Uh, Jonah actually said no. I love the story of Jonah. Uh, there's something cool in this story I've never seen before. Watch this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Now God's saying, I got a next step for you. I need you to go preach to, the, to Nineveh. This is, this, is a, uh, this is Jonah's story here. This is chapter 1, verse 1. Listen, you can't miss it. The Lord came to him, and he said, I want you to go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. So out the gate, out the gate, God says, Jonah, I got a job for you. Out the gate, God said, I got a word for you. There's a town. You're here. You're the prophet. I want you going there. You don't look like a prophet. You don't smell like a prophet. You don't look like a preacher. You don't smell like a preacher. But you're here. I need you over there. See, placement is where the power is at. It didn't do, any good. It didn't do him any good to be at home in the mountains of Galilee. That's where he lived. God said, I got something for you. The wickedness has come up before you. But look at this. The Bible says, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. I've been there. Listen, I ran and I ran and I ran. When God called me to ministry, I'm like, nope. Been there. I've seen what that looks like. I have seen the gore that is ministry, and I don't want to be there. Blood, blood, bloody parts everywhere. Let me tell you something. It is ugly. I, I just don't even want to, God, I don't even want to, I don't even think. Listen, I'm telling you right now, from the time I was born to the time I was probably 27 years old, I never once considered ever going to ministry. It wasn't, it wasn't even something I even thought about. 
But when God calls you, you better answer. It took me a few years, but I finally answered. You know that person that calls you and won't hang up, but just keeps ringing? Back in the day before you had answering machines, just 18 rings because they know you're there. He finally answered because you're annoyed. I mean, I finally I was like, okay, God, uh, okay, I'll go, I'll go. Whatever you want me to do, I don't understand it. I ain't that guy. I ain't my personality. But I'll start a Bible study if that's what you want me to do. Listen, Jonah ran away. I get it. I've done it. You've done it. Some of you are doing it right now. You're running away. And God said, I got something for you. Jonah ran away. But here's what I want you to see. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship that was bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now, here's what I want you to see. Jonah lived in the mountains of Galilee. He went down to the port. All right? He went down to the town. He went down to the port. And then he went down to the ship. And then he went down even further. If you know the story, he got thrown out of the boat, and then he was down in the belly of a well. Because here's, here's why the word down is so important, because every step away from God is a step down. Every step that you take away from God is a step down. He went down to Joppa. He went down to the port. He went down to the boat. He went down into the belly of the fish. Every step that you take away from God is a step down. See, if God, if he went where God was telling him, he went the other way, and it wouldn't have been down. It would have been that other way. It probably would have been up. I don't know. But every step away from God is a step down. You have to say yes to your next step. God's got a next step for you. Maybe, again, maybe it's baptism. Maybe, you, maybe you're sitting this morning, man, I got saved. I've never been baptized. I've surrendered my life to Jesus, but I've never been baptized. We want to help you with that. Fill out that card. Check that box. Let us know. We'll tell you what you can do. Maybe you haven't been serving on the team. Maybe you see all these people with Dream Team shirts on, and they look happy and high five people. Yeah, it can be you for the low, low price of zero dollars. What is it going to take for us to put you in a Dream Team shirt today? That's a little used car salesman joke there, if you don't know. What is it going to take? You have, you have to say yes. So, listen, God wants us to be all in. He wants us to be all in. Listen, they, I get it. I, I, know, I know that you're struggling with who you are. I know that you're struggling with, can I do that? I, I don't even know enough about the Bible. I can't go teach third graders. Yes, you can, because we're going to help you do it. We're going to show you how to do it. We're going to give you the material. We're going to tell you, here's step one, here's step two, here's step three. Here's what we do. Man, I can't serve on a team. I don't know anybody. Well, that's how you get to know people. I can't get into a life group because nobody knows who I am. Well, we're going to get to know you. And to be honest with you, a little too well. You know what I'm saying? Because when you, And it happens, man. It's funny. It happens. People are like, I don't want to just spill my... You don't have to. You come in there and be quiet if you want to. It ain't going to last very long, but you can do it. I have people... It might be two semesters, three semesters. It might be two years. But one day you're going to be like... You just like open your mouth and you'll just vomit all over everybody. Not physical, but spiritual vomit. We've seen it happen. Oh, I was talking to somebody the other day. Uh, they didn't want to go to life group. They thought it was some sort of cultic thing. I ain't going in there. They're going to be singing Kumbaya, which we only do twice a year, by the way. <laughs> I know that's what people think. And Then they went, and they went back another week, and another week, and two semesters later, now they're helping lead a group. And it won't be long. They're probably going to help lead groups, and they're going to be a coach over many groups. But that's how it, it takes. It starts with a step. And let me just talk to you spiritual leaders of your house this morning. If you don't take the step, don't expect your kids to. I'm just going to put a little weight on you this morning. You have to take the step. You have to say yes. You have to get up and read your word. You have to spend some time praying. You have to say yes to Dream Team. You have to say yes. If you want your kids to serve, I, I hear people say all the time, I want my kids to be in church when they grow up. Well, you better be here because it ain't going to happen. If you, In fact, they're going to come less than you do, so you better be here. For, we ain't only open one time a week. You better come twice if you want your kids to be here. I'm just telling you, it's, it's the way it is. It's the way that you, you, we're going to have to say yes. There's a, there's a lot more writing on this than just your, your, your weekend that you think you're giving up. Your kids are watching what you're doing. I just want to put some weight on this this morning because I want you to know that when you say yes, your family says yes. Watch that. When you say yes, the people around you see you saying yes. I don't know what they got, but I want some up. Why would anybody serve? And I, Listen, let me just tell you, I'm going to double down. I haven't talked to our leadership team yet, but our dream teamers, we're going to pay you all twice what we paid you all last year. That's right. That's right. I'm just going out. That's on faith. I'm just going to say that on faith. We're going to pay y'all twice what we paid y'all last year. Two shirts. Yes. <laughs> two shirts. Shirts are comfortable, aren't they? I might wear mine next week. I wear my, my, my serve day shirt. But you, gotta, you have to say, yeah, listen, it's more to it. It's more to it than just, than just showing up. You become part of a team. Getting into a life group, you're becoming part of a bigger family. 
I'm just telling you right now, you'll be ble- it'll bless your socks off to show up to the group of people who will call and check on you when you're sick and wish you a happy birthday when it's that time, and sometimes even just take you to lunch just because they like you. But be likable to get that part of it. But every step is a step away from God. You've got to say yes. And then, it, you know what the Bible says about drawing near to God? If you draw near to him, we'll draw near to you, and then you can resist the devil. See, someone's trying to resist the devil, but we ain't near to God, and you ain't doing no good. You've got to draw near to him. He'll draw near to you. Then you can resist the devil and start taking those steps. Here's number three. First of all, you can't be tethered to a title. You cannot be tethered to a title. Get that. You've got to say yes to your next step. Here's number three. Uh, I, I thought of a bunch of different ways to say this. In fact, I've rewritten it several times. I just came up with this simple saying right here. I want you to get this, though, because I think it encompasses everything. Uh, You've got to be married to your mission. Marry your mission. Like, when you say yes, don't be like, yeah, I'll try it for a week. No, give us six months. Man, try life group for a semester. Try a dream team for six months. Give it some time. You've got to marry. You've got to be all in. You've got to say yes. I was... um. Thinking about uh, uh, the, the Wright brothers, um, I had heard some things about them. I never really studied them before, the, the people who had been in the airplane. And I found this out. This is kind of interesting. Um, they actually aren't from Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. They're from Dayton, Ohio, where they had a bicycle shop. And in that bicycle shop, one of the brothers who was kind of an introvert, he didn't go to college, uh, he stayed at home to take care of his mom, which is where he started reading books on science, and really got captivated with the idea of uh, there were guys who were trying to fly like, uh, like uh, man gliders, uh, one guy crashed and died from it. And so anyway, he just, it, just it, it wouldn't leave him alone. And so he just kept working at it. Finally, they built a little a little glider in, in, um, in Dayton, Ohio. But what happened was they, um, they really struggled with the wind. There was no wind in, in, uh, in Dayton. So they started, they, went, they got to the National Service, they, they wrote them, and the National Service sent them a, a list of all the towns that had the highest wind reporting, and so that's where Kitty Hawk comes in. Kitty Hawk comes in because they had a sustained wind of about 22, which was really, they didn't understand this, but it was zero or like 40. It was no like sustained 22 mile an hour winds. And so that's why they moved everything to Kitty Hawk. They didn't move to Kitty Hawk, they would just go there, bring their stuff, and they would climb on top of a... Um, they would climb on top of a hill and jump off of it, and that's how they did it. In fact, it's pretty cool. The very first flight took off of Kill Devil Hill. That was the name of it in South Carolina. I like that. I want to build a church on Kill Devil Hill. How about y'all? And so that's where they jumped off of. And, but they were married to it. Listen, they didn't just go, you know what? And there were times they wanted to give up. I'm not, don't get me wrong. There were times where it crashed and burned. It didn't work out. They had to keep repairing it. They couldn't find the right supplies. They couldn't find the right materials. I mean, it was a lot of work. And finally... They got it going, and it took them three years, three or four years. They started in, like, 1899, and they had their first flight, I think, in 1903 in December, and it was incredible. But they, but they moved their stuff to the other town because that's where it was happening. That's where it was working. That's where it was, they were going to actually fulfill their vision. And for you this morning, I want to tell you this morning that, that you're going to have to do some moving. If you feel stagnant, you're going to have to move. It's being still is one thing. Being stagnant is a whole other thing. Being still and being stagnant are two different things. We gotta understand today that we gotta marry our mission. If that means God's moving you, that means He's moving you. That means you need to take some steps in a certain direction, then that's just what it means. Here, look at what Elisha did. Elisha left him, he went back, he took his yoke of oxen, he slaughtered them and burned the plowing equipment to cook them and gave the food to the guys around him. He was all stinking in. You hear me? He was all in. You can't be all in. Unless you burn, he, he burnt the equipment. He, listen, he cut the, can you imagine the oxen, like, they're taking the yoke off. They're like, oh, good, we're done for the day. <laughs> nope. <clears throat> Surprise. Bleed them out right there and cook them up. You know, uh, Cortez, uh, there's a story about him back in the 1500s when this guy inva- in, in, invaded uh, Vera Cruz, I believe. Uh, he burned the ship so they couldn't go back. Now, that could just be a fable. I don't know. It's a pretty cool story burn the ships. I'm just telling you, take that step, cut the safety net out, and just keep on going. Marry them. Be married to the mission. One of the things that we're here at WRC, we marry the mission, but we date the process. So we're married to the mission of reaching people, but we're gonna, the process may change over the years. And if we don't change, we're probably going to get left behind. So we're going to change the process as we need to. We're not married to the process. We're married to the mission. Listen, the mission is the focus. You've got to be focused on it. You got to be willing to move if you have to move. Listen, the Wright brother said, it ain't working here. We're going to have to go somewhere else. And it wasn't an easy ride. They had to get into little skiff boats. In fact, they, had, they tell the story. The water was, they were actually having to, to take a pail and bail out water the whole time just to keep the thing from, from sinking, the boat from sinking. They went from one little boat to the next boat. He said, finally, I'm getting a good boat. That boat had worse holes than the boat before. And they were constantly, and they had to do all this just to get to the right place. 
Because I'm telling you, placement is so powerful. To put the piece of paper that was trash in the seat will save the seat. The placement is the, where the value comes in. There's a value in placement. Because here's what I want to tell you. Here's why it's time to move for some of you. Some of you are doing the right things, but you're not seeing the exponential change. It's because you're doing it in the wrong place. Because here's what I know. You can do the right things in the wrong wind. See, they were doing all the right things. They, they had the, the, the right brothers. Had the, they had everything. They didn't change really the form a lot, a little, few little things. They, they could glide in, in Dayton, Ohio if they had the wind. So you could be doing the right things in the wrong wind. God's just wanting to move some of you. God's just wanting you to do a little change, to, to move a little bit. <clears throat> Elisha was plowing the field. There was nothing wrong with that. It was time for him to move, and when he took that step, he let go of something lesser to reach for something greater. There's nothing wrong with plowing a field, but if God's calling you to be a prophet, you're just a prophet with a plow. You're not a farmer. you got to marry the mission. Be all in. He was all in. He burned the plow, cooked the meat. He was done. He didn't have to worry about if they were going to take care of his oxen. He didn't have to worry about who was going to drive them, if they were going to drive it crooked. He just got rid of that. He's like, you know what? This job is over. This is done in my life. I'm moving on. And he had two times the amount of miracles that Elijah had because he asked for double the portion. So you can be doing the right things in the wrong way. You, you, you have to make sure that you're moving and not just taking crazy steps, but stepping in the right direction. And God will bless it. I'm telling you, there's power in placement. There's value in placement. Some of you here this morning, and it's time for you to start moving. It's time for you to, to take that step. Maybe you've just been, maybe you just been uh, coming and sitting on Sunday mornings. It's time for you to get on the team. Maybe you've had, been bringing a burden with you every week. It's time for you to lay it at the altar. Maybe you're here this morning, you've never tried life here. Maybe that's your step to take. Maybe you've never opened up your Bible in front of your kids. Maybe you've never prayed over your kids. Maybe you've never shown them that you love Jesus as much as, as they, they, they think that they love you. Listen, God wants to move in your life, but you have to take that step. You can be doing the right things in the wrong way, struggling and fighting. Just take that move. Make that move, and there's, there's value in placement. Place yourself in another position and watch what God does. Listen, I've seen people on teams who were serving in a position as a dream teamer, made a move, and now they're running multiple teams. It's just a position change. God has something bigger for you, but you have to take the step. It's time to burn the plow, sacrifice the meat, and watch God work.